In some parts of Asia, baby eels are called white diamonds. As they become increasingly rare, their prices are soaring. You're talking about organized criminality, organized criminal gangs operating multi-million pound trade. Here's the story behind one of the world's most slippery black markets. They just can't resist the money that's being made right now. But what makes eels so expensive? And who are these criminals making millions off their slimy bags? So what's up with eels? Sure, they have a reputation for being kind of freaky, slimy, and hard to handle. All the fishermen need is the tide to come rolling in so that the cash can come in too. But certain eels, specifically some baby freshwater eels of the Anguilla family, have become an extremely valuable commodity that brings in billions of dollars worldwide. Three men facing charges tonight for stealing more than a million dollars worth of, wait for it, frozen eels. Young American and European eels regularly fetch more than $2,000 per pound. And in Japan, which makes up 70% of the world's eel demand, a kilogram of immature Japanese eels can cost as much as $35,000. And part of why eels have such a high price tag is because they're vanishing. And we don't totally understand why. It could be related to climate change or overfishing. But one of the main reasons eels are in trouble is the damming of rivers, which cuts off access to their habitats. Plus, we don't know very much about how they reproduce in the wild. So we've been unable to reproduce them in captivity. However, what we can do is catch wild baby glass eels and raise them to adulthood in fish farms, many of which are based in Japan and China, where demand is highest. The International Union for Conservation of Nature has classified the Japanese eel as an endangered species. 70% of the Japanese eel population disappeared between the 1960s and 2000, so the market turned to Europe. With the new demand, European eels were worth a fortune. The only problem, they were facing the same kinds of pressures decimating their Asian cousins, leaving the species on the brink of collapse. Soon, the IUCN had designated the European eel as critically endangered. Countries began imposing catch limits and strict regulatory schemes. And in 2010, the EU outright banned almost all imports and exports of the species. But with prices so high, a little thing like an EU ban wasn't about to stop the flow of eels. And the black market exploded. Like any criminality area, be drugs, be firearms, be people trafficking, it's just, it's just driven by money. But it's quite a specialist area to deal with. They're live creatures and you've got to have some form of knowledge of how to obtain and where to get them from, how to transport them, how to keep them alive and so forth. Smuggling eels out of Europe can be as simple as mislabeling a commercial shipment, disguising them as another type of fish. This was the technique used by Gilbert Koo a UK exporter who in 2020 was convicted of smuggling more than $68 million worth of glass eels. The guy was bringing stuff in from Spain, holding it within UK, probably supplementing with UK eels, and then shipping it out about three or four days later as fish, frozen fish. Most of Ku's illegal shipments went to Malaysia and Hong Kong, though those weren't necessarily the final destinations. The big players within China within the fish farms, we're getting them into those fish farms, whichever route they can go through. It used to be through Hong Kong, but it's going through Malaysia, Vietnam, Korea. They will finance the, the mules coming over to Europe to, to pick them up. These so-called fish mules often use a smuggling system known as the suitcase method. That's when you're bringing the mules in, coming in from Asia. They'll pick up their suitcase full of glass eels, and then they'll fly back on commercial flights. Eel trafficking rings often span several countries, and policing them requires international reach. When they had a quantity sufficiently important, they were carried in a camion, they were in a ferry in Barcelona, they came to Italy, they crossed Italy by road, they came to the other coast, they came to take a ferry, which they took finally to Greece. In Greece, they did an exchange of companies, and at the end, they came to the destination of Hong Kong. So, a series of Europol and Interpol crackdowns coordinated local authorities across borders, marshalling agencies like the UK's National Wildlife Unit and Seprona in Spain. The European crackdown only further limited global supplies, leading to even higher eel prices. And so, people looking to score more eel again had to look elsewhere. The world caught on that, oh, wait a minute, we can get eels in this little state in the northeast corner 
of the United States. Bill Trotter is a reporter with the Bangor Daily News in Maine, one of only two states where catching Elvis is legal and the only one with a large eel fishery. He was there when what was once a sleepy maritime trade turned into the Wild West. So if you just get one bucket of eels, that's worth you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of eels. One of the problems that we had last year and we're gonna have again this year is illegal harvesting. They robbed my eels, they didn't take my money. But the most common form of US eel crime was catching elvers in states where it wasn't legal and then selling them to Maine's international wholesalers who passed them off as local. Eel laundering, if you will. The dealers, they were carrying around big duffel bags full with like hundreds of thousands of dollars and they all had guns on their hips because they were easy targets if they were gonna get robbed. Maybe most famous among these heavily armed, cash-toting eelers was a man named Bill Sheldon. Once known as the grandfather of eel fishing, Sheldon helped build Maine's fishery at the Department of Marine Resources, later becoming one of the state's most successful eel dealers. A sort of local celebrity, he was immediately recognizable by his odd patchwork fur coat. In 2017, the US Fish and Wildlife Service busted Sheldon, then 70 years old, for laundering out-of-state eels as part of a sting operation codenamed Broken Glass. He was sentenced to six months in prison in 2018. Since his release, Sheldon has gotten back into the eel business and has expressed remorse for his actions. He's even written poems about it, as seen in this local news clip. I'm 71 and live my life free from crime. I never did think I'd be doing jail time. Then along came a warden with eels to sell, and tragically, into his trap I soon fell. Fur coat Bill might have been the last of Maine's outlaw eels kings. Everything is traceable now. Every sale is documented electronically at a dealer's office, and the state has access to all that information. They know which fishermen sold how many eels or how many pounds of eels to what dealer on what day. But money isn't the only reason people become obsessed with eels. My name's Nick. I've pretty much always been interested in fish. Um, the weirder, the better. That's kind of why I love the eels. Nick Tobler is TikTok's eel pit guy. Called that because, well, he can show you. So this is my garage, and this uh, manhole in the corner is the entrance to my eel pit. So I'll hop down there and uh, show you around. His over one million followers have cheered him on as he transformed an old rainwater cistern into the eel habitat of his dreams. There's actually Ely Dan right there. But yeah, look how cute their eyes are. That's, they are really so cool. <laughs> Living alongside other fish like Gar, Nick's pet American eels have names like Crunchwrap Supreme and Bathtub. He hopes meeting them can change how his audience sees eels. People comment all the time, it's like, you totally changed my opinion on eels. And it's like, I. I, like being afraid of eels is something that never even like occurred to me that people were. Eels are definitely like one of the friendliest aquatic animals that are out there. While the worldwide eel situation might seem dire, there are some potential signs of positive change. Conservation groups and wildlife agencies have learned to build eel ladders, passageways that help the fish bypass dammed or high traffic waterways. And even now, there are eel scientists trying to finally crack the secret of breeding eels in captivity, which could take pressure off wild populations, even if the black market can never be fully shut down. There'll always be eel smuggling. There'll always be a demand for eels. People love their nagi. Eels are a good example of the Catch-22 feedback loop facing all kinds of vulnerable species. From elephants and rhinos to pangolins, glass eels and rosewood, organized crime groups are sabotaging planet for profit through the poaching, trafficking, and illicit sale of wildlife, forest products, and marine resources. Environmental problems and trafficking lead to population's decline, which only makes these animals more valuable. And that value leads to more black market trafficking, which only ratchets up the problems and prices. So yes, eels might not be as cuddly as other endangered creatures, but they are a perfect microcosm of the cascading problems facing our natural world.